Good evening and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Um, as you've seen in the last six months or so, we've led our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance and I have the distinct honor and privilege of asking our fellow board member, John Kaminsky, who is a veteran, to lead us tonight in that Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks. And while we're on that subject, I would very much like to thank all the veterans of our country, particularly those from Midland. Uh, children of our employees, our employees who are veterans, our students who will be veterans. It always amazes me at graduation how many people we have volunteering for our country. And I uh, just want to let you know personally and on behalf of the board, we appreciate it. So thank you. With that, Mr. Secretary, can we move into the role? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Here. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstand. Here. Member Gordon. Here. Member McFarland. Here. Member Singer. She's absent. She's absent. And she did inform us she would be absent yeah. when she was asked to serve. <laughs> um, that said, the first item on the agenda is the consent agenda. You'll see the, the items. I won't list them today. They're relatively short. Um, anything, any questions and or additions and or deletions from the consent agenda items? Seeing none, I'll take a motion on the consent agenda. Move to approve consent agenda 2.1 through 2.4 as identified in the agenda. Support. Moved by Member McFarland, support by Treasurer Branstad. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Move on to request to address the board. We have no formal requests this evening, but anyone is free to come and address the board for a period of five minutes. Please state your name, school attendance area, and your address if you would. No volunteers. That that, we'll move on to Board of Education matters, and I'll hand it over to Superintendent Sherrill. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bob Fox to you today. As you know, I wrote to you a few weeks ago about uh, Michigan High School Code Michigan Project winners, and they won a couple of awards and some finances as well. So I'll let them uh, let you know what the, uh, introduce what they did. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for, for inviting us to talk to you tonight. I, uh, I never like to miss an opportunity to brag about my students, so I, I really appreciate this. Um, my name is Bob Fox. I'd like to introduce to you Aaron Green and uh, Thor Russell, and uh, the fourth member of our team, he had to work tonight, so unfortunately, unfortunately he could not be here, but uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to wing this without him. Um, I'm going to start out and talk to you just a little bit about what this contest was, how it got started, and everything like that. And then I'm going to have the boys talk about uh, what we actually did and the awards that, that we won. So um, you probably remember when, when Governor Snyder ran for office a, a number of years ago that, that his campaign slogan was um, reinventing Michigan, reinventing government, and, and rethinking the way that, that we do things. And this competition was a direct uh, result of that. Um, so him and his, his tech team put this together uh, starting uh, almost a year ago. And uh, it's kind of interesting because this contest wasn't designed for high school students. Uh, in fact, we were the only high school team there. This was really aimed at industry professionals uh, and, and uh, maybe a few college teams. But, but the whole idea of, uh, of high school wasn't, wasn't on their radar. And to be honest, we never would have found out about it if it wasn't for a couple of colleagues of mine who just happened to uh, uh, be having breakfast, actually, with one of the um, uh, organizers of the competition. And they started talking about, well, could a high school team do this? And uh, th this gentleman got really excited about that prospect. And uh, so that's, that's how we, we got involved. And I'll tell you, though, when I first heard about it, I'm like, ooh, professionals, I'm not sure. That, one, that might be out of our league. Um, but, uh, but the more I started uh, thinking about it, the more of a good opportunity I realized it was. And I was able to contact some bright young former students that I had. They finished my, my AP computer science class last year, and uh, uh, they just did an outstanding job. So just a little bit about, about the contest. The, the purpose was uh, to create an app, a mobile app for either a smartphone or a tablet. And the goal was to use what's called civic coding. And civic coding means 
create a software product that would either benefit the citizens of Michigan or improve transparency in government. So that was the objective, that was the mission, but there wasn't a whole lot of direction beyond that. Um, the other thing that it had to utilize was what's known as open data. And in the software industry, the open data movement, it's getting, it's getting very big, but the idea is that there's a lot of data out there, and most of it's private. And for some of that data, there's a good reason it's private. For example, all our student records here at MPS are, are private, and they need to be. But the thought is that a lot of that data that's private really doesn't need to be private. And maybe if we open that up and let people use it, they could innovate and do new and interesting things with it. And so that was really the premise going in, into this whole competition. So we were able to start thinking about it back in August when we, when we signed up and decided to do it. Um, though we couldn't actually start development until the first weekend in October. So we were thinking about ideas, we were talking, we were doing a lot of brainstorming, but it was Friday, October 4th, 7 o'clock was go, and we had 36 hours nonstop to, to develop this app. And uh, if you've ever been around software, that is a really quick turnaround time um, to, do, uh, to do really anything. Um, to be honest, I would have liked to have had about four weeks and about twice as many people. So, but, uh, but we managed to, uh, to put something together. So the judging of this, so we, you know, we have 36 hours to write this app, but then the judging also required us to produce, shoot, and submit a YouTube video by Sunday morning. So we're developing an app, we're making a YouTube video, and that was the initial round of judging. So once the, the judges saw those videos, then they did callbacks for, for the finalists. And though, to be honest, we didn't know we were gonna have to do this last presentation. Uh, because we figured by the time we were getting up to that point, they would have told us if we were a finalist, but they didn't. So we had about a half an hour lead time, and we were doing a presentation <laughs> to uh, the judges, venture capitalists, and state officials, including a couple of director level positions at the at the state level. So it was uh, it was slightly intimidating, but I don't think we had enough time to be nervous about it. Um, and so that's how the judging went. Now, what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Thorne. He's going to actually talk and show you the app that we did and, and how it went. <laughs> All right, so MyLegy was a fun little app to use to see what your uh, state senate representative are doing. So when it first loads up, it asks for your address, and you put that in, and then it will use geolocation to find who your exact state senator and representative are. Then it brings you to this main page right here, where you have a list of the most recent bills that uh, shows whether they're in state, house, anything like that. Huh. And you can even, uh, Use the search feature, type to filter kind of thing, and you can search for senator, representative, or even just any type of keyword to look for something you are interested in as far as the bill itself. And then our, our biggest thing that uh, was something we really shot for to make sure this would work is that when you find an interesting bill, something that you are passionate about or you're wondering, why did my legislator vote for that? You can actually share it to Facebook, you can send it over text message, emails, that way everyone knows exactly what's going on from in their legislation. So we won a couple of awards from this. There were a total of four awards given away by the government for this. Or we, yeah, four. four awards, yeah. So there was the like first place award, which was $20,000, and then a uh, crowd favorite award that they said they were going to give out for $5,000 and then a best idea award for $1,000. And this first award that we won was the best civic engagement award and when they announced this award after the judging they said they actually the judges had created this award just for our app because we I guess were the app that followed what they wanted the contest to be about the best which was improving the state of Michigan since we were trying to promote transparency in government. So that was $2,500. And the second award was the crowd favorite award. And they did a live text message polling for the, like when the judges were judging in the conference room, all the um, other participants just text messaged a number that they put on the screen, uh, which app they thought was their favorite. And we won that by one vote, and that was worth $5,000. So totally took $7,500.
think the computer teacher can use PowerPoint. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to finish up, and of course, we'll, we'll take whatever questions you might have, but I wanted the guys to talk a little bit about what they got out of this, what they felt like was the, the, best, the best takeaways from them from, from the weekend. Um, my personal best takeaway, I think, was just uh, showing the importance of trying to make a finished product as far as programming itself is. This is the first time I've ever actually done anything on this grand of a scale to try and work with more than just one other person to create it. So it really showed a more real life example of what you make. Yeah, this is a great experience to show how beneficial it can be to work with a team and just how you have to make sure you can work together with a bunch of other people because I'd never worked with more than one person on a program before or software. And it was a lot of fun and definitely a lot of help to be able to work and collaborate with three other people for this app. And normally there would be a lot more I know for designing an app or some sort of software. That was really my main takeaway from it. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, because this was targeted at, uh, at uh, professionals, you had to have someone on the team who was 18 years old. So I was really happy that I got to do this with them. It was, it was amazing. Because I take my kids all over the country doing these, these programming competitions, but they're, they're all for high school kids. So you know I always have to sit on the sideline nervously waiting to see what happens. So it was kind of fun to, uh, to get elbow deep in this and, and go after it, too, just, uh, just uh, like, uh, like they did. So what questions do you have? I've got a bunch, but I have to defer from the chair, so I'll, I'll pass off, John. Well, I'm, I'm just curious, with as much exposure as you had for this app, where is it now, and you know, how is, as far as implementation and getting it out on a larger scale? Sure, that's a great question, and um, you're not the first person to ask that. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, the thing is, when, you, when it comes to do, you know, this is a prototype, and it works, and, and, and all of that, but there's a rule in software. You get 80% of it done in 20% of the time, and we're not 80% of the way there yet. So um, we, we haven't decided if we're going to take this to its conclusion or not, um, mostly because the time that it would take to um, make sure that it, the code is written properly. I mean, we're jerry-rigging all kinds of things together to make this thing work. It's not backward compatible with, with uh, other devices. Uh, all we've done is make an, an Android version of it. There isn't anything for iPhone or, or Windows. Um, and all the time it would take to do that, plus once you release it, you're not done. You have to maintain it through its life cycle. So the hundreds, if not thousands of hours it would take, we really would need to have a clear objective in mind of what, what we would want to uh, what we would want to do with that. Just doing it to do it is probably not worth the effort just based upon how many hundreds of hours it would take to do that, if that makes sense. Does someone want to buy the rights to it from you? Um, actually, we, we have the rights to it. And that was one of no, the did you, Could you to finish it up? Could you sell it to somebody and let them finish it up? We That's, that's a possibility, and we've talked about that too. Um, public service apps are very hard to monetize. Um, we've done a little bit of homework in that regard. And the app market's very fickle. You can put an app up for free and get a million downloads and make it $1 and you get zero downloads. And it really is that touchy. So other, other apps that are civic minded or websites that are civic minded like that, nobody has yet monetized them. I don't know, that doesn't mean we couldn't be the first. But, uh, and then of course, whenever you, you start tying money into politics, then things get tricky for other reasons as well. So we'll see. I guess is the answer to that. Um, <clears throat> since you c connected with mostly professional um, groups, have you guys had an opportunity or been contacted? I mean, I'm just thinking future with college or what opportunities might be out there just for, for taking this um, chance to go and do this presentation and expose yourselves to what you're capable of doing. Well, we did get a couple uh, paid internship offers from a few people. I think they were in Lansing, and it was either Detroit or Ann Arbor. So they were both, I mean, I plan on going either to U of M or State, and I believe they were at the two colleges, so that, I mean, I've got an opportunity whichever college I go to. And so that was pretty cool. And I think someone else approached us to finish it or something, but I don't remember exactly what that is. Near the lobbyist. <laughs> Says that well. Just annoying lobbyist. Yeah, I got to tell you, it was almost a little bit hard to get work done at times. We're in this room and um, and working away, and because they were the only high schoolers there, we were kind of the spectacle of the weekend. Mm -hmm. So you know, as these um, uh, venture capitalists and these these you know CEOs of these tech startups uh, were around, they always wanted to come in, and so we did the meet and greet. I don't know. 
20, 30 times in 24 hours. And uh, of course, the question was always, what are you guys doing? So we got that speech down pretty well as, as what's, go <laughs> what's going on. We had to start shooing people away or we weren't going to finish on time. Were there other apps that were created with the same central idea that you guys used that is identifying bills, telling where they're coming from, either the House or the Senate, who sponsored them, and kind of a highlight of, as to what they're about, or is that just unique to what you guys came up with against the competition? That, at that contest, that was unique to what we, we came up with. I mean, there's other, you know, like websites and things like that where certainly you can get that bill information. Um, but not in an app form and not with the social media sharing component. But nobody was doing anything like it at that, at that contest. What kind of process did you guys go through to come up with that idea? I, I, and I love it, by the way. I think it's amazing. And I, w I, I checked while you guys were going through it. And um, you, you know, at, this was before you mentioned that it didn't really go out for public mm -hmm. um, use. I was looking to see if it was available for the iPhone. Sure. Oh, it's, it's a ways to go before that. You guys want to talk about our process and what we, what we came up with? Yeah, so Mr. Fox emailed uh, Thor, Richard, and I during the summer. So we had, like, I don't know, a few days to decide whether or not we wanted to do this because tickets, there were 200 tickets available to go to this competition. They were going fast. So after we decided that we were going to do it, um, we started setting up dates to just meet in the computer lab at school and talk about what we wanted to do. So for our brainstorming ideas, we started out with maybe some sort of affordable housing app and then. Uh, I kind of had some other ideas like something with alternative energy because that's kind of a trending topic right now but we really wanted to do something that we knew more about and that like we could all relate to so I don't know where this particular idea came from but when we heard about it or thought of it we thought it was a great idea and that it would be really good for the competition. Is, is this a competition that will continue every year and based on that if it does do you think that more high school teams will base well that that's the plan that you know the, the people who we talk to they say that they want to continue it and try to expand it um, for, for future years because this was the first year that it uh, that it existed and uh, I think they like the idea of having high school teams there so I think that that's an option that uh, that they're looking to pursue mm -hmm. so you met before to figure out your central theme and then you had to go to a central location to do the do your coding uh, or, you know, what, when, what, when you had the 36 hour window, how did they do the ready, set, go? Oh, that, that's a good question. This was down in uh, downtown Detroit at the Madison building, which is, I didn't realize this. I thought they were just doing this to be gimmicky, but they spell Madison with an at symbol, like, you, like in an email. And what I didn't realize is that there's a ton of real estate downtown being bought up that's being turned into this tech startup workspace. I mean, it was really high end, really innovative. The walls were dry running boards, I mean, entirely. Uh, but we had them covered. Uh, and uh, so it was down there. So everybody started there, and then the workspace was divvied up. So food was there. Everything, everything was there. But you couldn't create code before you got there. No, we did some proof of concepts on some technologies that we weren't familiar with, but we didn't actually do any development on the app. Okay. And for the two young men, what are your future plans? College and degrees. One's going to state. Yeah. <laughs> no, or U of M, he said. Either oh. state or U of M. <laughs> it also depends whether or not I get accepted, of course. But I, I'm actually planning on doing something in genetics. Is what uh, something I've been interested in since sixth grade. But I'll probably have uh, computer science on the side, and maybe be a dual major. I haven't quite figured that out just yet. My plan right now is to go to Hope College and double major in computer science and some philosophy or religious studies. Wow. Fascinating. Any other questions? <coughs> well, Just thank you for coming out. Thank you Good for job, representing. Guys. Thank you very much. Wow. And I, I did notice the vocabulary, you know, when, uh, when you talked about things that are evolving, you speak of them as a trending mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> Us old guys still call it a trend, a trendy mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming out. Well, the next group is to follow that up. Uh, uh, Linda, are you going to introduce everybody? So we have a team of educators here to talk about the IB primary years program and our progress up to, d to this date.
Well, I want to thank you for inviting us to share this evening about the International Baccalaureate Primary Years Program. Um, we want to begin just a little bit with the history of PYP within the district and how we got to where we are, to what we're going to share with you today. Several years ago, the district formed an International Baccalaureate Advisory Team to review the effect and the effort that was going on at the um, high school level with the diploma program, and during that time to also look at the middle years and primary years programs. That larger group then um, encouraged the groups to form subcommittees. So we worked with the subcommittee on the primary years program, um, which is focusing at the elementary level. And after tiers of exploration and visitations and analysis, um, that subcommittee made a recommendation to move forward with PYP. And the board supported that, the addition of that program. So with funding support from the Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation, the Roland M. Gerstacker Foundation, and the Charles J. Strohsacker Foundation, we're moving forward with implementing the learner profile um, with all elementary schools. But in addition to that, this year, four elementary schools that include Adams, Chestnut Hill, Plymouth, and Woodcrest are beginning the first year of a three-year training process. Um, this first year is called the consideration phase. Um, the four schools were identified because the other three elementary schools, Carpenter, Eastland, and Seabrook, already had significant initiatives that they were working on and wanted that extra year to get those under um, a little firmer ground before they tried, got into something new. So they were going to be doing a learner profile as all of us are, but with that initial training, it's looking really um, at our four schools this year, which is what we're talking with you about tonight. So again, uh, this training is a three-year process, um, and it's and I guess at this point I'd like to introduce Bridget Hockmeyer, principal of Plymouth Elementary, who's going to share more about that. Thank you, Linda. Good evening. As Linda mentioned, four schools have been selected to dig deeper into PYP. Woodcrest and Plymouth have teamed up as sister schools, along with Chestnut Hill and Adams, for intentional and explicit professional development. We are very fortunate to have two master teachers as our PYP coordinators, Ellen Flegenheimer Riggle and Robin Harshman Rogers. Each month, our coordinators guide us through professional development that is systemic, building foundational layers, focusing on the components of PYP that encourage collaboration, cooperation, and a positive learning culture. Now, Ellen and Robin will take you through a snapshot of our journey, showing you how students, teachers, and principals create essential agreements, take risks as part of the learner profile, and understand the attributes of learning. Ellen and Robin? Okay, well, as we um, start, I'm the, I'm the Ellen of the hyphenated names here. We decided that you needed to have a hyphenated name to uh, have this uh, position. So when I am uh, the PYP coordinator for Plymouth and Woodcrest, and so for me, a great opportunity after many, many years of doing many things in the Midland Public Schools. So um, a new venture after you've been here a long time is kind of a neat experience. So I began by bringing this suitcase whoops, with me on our first day of school. It belongs to my daughter, who's now 22, but had this um, thing about playing airplane when she was three, so it was a Christmas present. And I packed the suitcase to um, share with the staff. So I'm gonna share with you just a few of the items um, that I put inside the suitcase. So I began with an old-fashioned viewfinder and I shared with the staff that we were going to look at um, what we do in a different way. We were going to view it differently, both looking backwards and looking forward. And then I showed it down. a set of puzzle pieces that looked like this. And I said that we were going to take this journey together and that we need to work collaboratively in order to reach our final destination. And I liked listening to the young men say that that was the first time they had worked at a team as a team and how much they liked that because this whole process, students, teachers, administration, 
auxiliary teachers, the paras, everybody are a part of this collaborative process. I packed a magnifying glass that lets us know we're going to look closely at what we have done in the past. We're going to think about how we can shift our teaching to help our students to become more actively involved, to become more engaged. And then I have with me a globe. Of course, this is foreign international. We need a globe for our travels. And it is to show that our students and teachers, all of us together, we're going to move forward so that we can hopefully send students out into the world, that they can make it a better place and a more caring world by developing in our students to have them become knowledgeable, caring, and inquiring. And then finally, I packed a key. And I chose to share the key with the um, staff to show them how important each one of us are in this process, in this journey, and that our keys are going to unlock this new way of doing things and that together we're going to be successful. And so kind of in this um, sisterhood here of the hyphenated uh, whatever <laughs> sisters, I guess, um, I'm the much more um, tangible um, presenter, the display, the object. And Robin is this very gifted um, person with technology, and so I call it the intangible part of this experience. So you're gonna, she's going to share with you a more in-depth look um, at where we are in the journey up to this point. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, we, we apparently have to have hyphenated names to have the job of TYP coordinator. We decided, <clears throat> excuse me, to kind of play off that, so we call ourselves hyphenated sisters. So uh, my job is to talk about our journey in terms of professional development and what we're seeing now in our buildings. So we began it in August with our first PD session, and we chose the analogy of a journey because we feel it's very fitting, and we've tied this as a theme into all of our professional developments. And whether it's Ellen's suitcase, or the reflections that we write into our passport journals at the end of every session. The emphasis is on this being a journey and as we head to our final destination of becoming an Ivy World School. Our first sessions focused on a general overview of the PYP for staff, as well as creating an essential agreement, which we have posted over there, um, for our sister schools as we work together. So not only are our students uh, creating essential agreements, we as adults are, are modeling that by creating that as well. Our next PD, which was in September, focused on the learner profile and talking about how important it is to the PYP. And we thought we'd review a couple of the key elements for you tonight. So the learner profile is actually the heart of the PYP. It's the profile of a whole person as a lifelong learner. It also encourages positive attitudes towards learning. And it focuses on the child as an inquirer. The attributes of the learner profile are ideals that inspire and focus the work of our teachers in our schools. And I just kind of thought that was a, an interesting picture. I didn't say that we all look like that. We've evolved also in our, <laughs> in our looks as well. Um, it also, the learner profile unites us in a common purpose and it, it allows us to have a common language with each other and with our students. And the learner profile attributes are central to the definition of an internationally minded person. And here are a few things that the learner profile is not. It is not the profile of a perfect student. And it also needs to reflect students' thoughts and their work, which is an integral part of the process and should be displayed. It's also a map toward a lifelong journey to international mindedness, emphasizing again the lifelong journey of learning. The attributes are descriptors that define the learners we aim to create through the PYP. And the IBO, or the International Baccalaureate Organization, defines the learner profile as the common ground on which schools stand. It's what they're about. 
So after our learner profile session, we moved to our third session, which was our five hour building wide um, PD, which was a daunting task for both Ellen and I to come up with five hours of PD. But actually, after we had that opportunity in planning, we kind of assumed we'd always have that time. And so it was a really valuable tool for us to get a lot of information to our, to our teachers. And a really, um, I think, one of the most uh, enriched and excited times, I think, for PD that I have been a part of in a long time. We had a lot of comments about that time that we were allowed to have together where we weren't going off to different places. And it was really a really wonderful session. Where at that time, we focused on a review of the learner profile. We added the attitudes. And we discussed inquiry-based learning, as well as the key concepts of the PYP. <clears throat> okay. So where we are now is we have four schools. We have two coordinators. We have 130 teachers, approximately, on staff. And we've so far had 10 hours of PD. This is just another picture from our Key Concepts Inquiry and Attitude session. And so where that takes us is um, one of the things that we focus on after each PD is to have teachers complete a task. We don't call it homework. We call it a task for the next time that we meet. And so we build into each PD session time to share and collaborate in order to gain new ideas and insight into the work that we're doing with the PYP. And a lot of what you'll see here that we've brought with us are things that teachers have created with their students. We also structure our sessions with a lot of group work for teachers to work in groups as a way to model strategies for teachers to use when they return to the classroom. We're also adding um, a building component where we're focusing either building wide on an attribute or an attitude for a month. So this month at Adams and Chestnut Hill, we're focusing on the learner profile attribute of caring. So in just 12 weeks, we have seen some remarkable changes in our buildings and in our students. And when you think of that, that's really just 60 school days. So in all of our classrooms, we have essential agreements created, whether it's in art class or Spanish classes. All of the teachers have created essential agreements with their classes. And this is a shift where students have a voice in creating the guidelines, and they actually have ownership. And you can see that they've all signed it. Teachers refer to these agreements daily when discussing their expectations and their behaviors. And we've also seen a shift in classroom culture with a common language being used. This is Mr. Nathie's board. He's here in the audience. This is an ongoing process. And as we move toward teaching and learning and, and that is inquiry-based, and this is something that we include in each PD sessions, and teachers are taking back to their classrooms and working with their students. Collaboration with our teachers has also been renewed. We've really kind of opened our doors a little bit, where we kind of have all kind of done our own thing. And so it's really nice to open those doors and work together. We've also refocused and revisited the importance of cooperative learning and small group work, which is essential to full implementation of the PYP. In our buildings, you also see work on display. And it may not look the same in each classroom or in each building, but there is a common thread with the common language and the concepts. Those are some more displays. And our new phrase is, live it, don't laminate it. So we want things to not just be up and pretty and laminated, but really to be growing and changing and evolving as we learn and as our students learn. This is another um, display from a classroom where students' thinking is highlighted. You'll also see the learner profile in students' language that students are creating. And their work and thoughts are on display. And another component that's been really exciting for me is to have our media paraprofessionals have been fantastic in finding resources and 
um, grouping them according to attributes. And if I ask them for something at 9 o'clock in the morning, usually I have it by 1030. It's just been a really wonderful <coughs> contribution that they've made to building our program. So our next stops for our journey, um, that we're going to site visit this Friday. Um, we'll go for our November visit to a school in Fenton. 15 MPS staff will be going, and another group will head out to a different school in January for another visit. And we will continue to use our professional development time as staff development time, and we really appreciate our principal's willingness to do kind of housekeeping things through email so that we can really focus our time on learning and growing as teachers. We'll also be planning our units of inquiry which will include actually writing those units, which we plan to start doing in January. And then we have our application for our, this is our consideration year. We'll also be applying this year formally in April. And we luckily have resources here within the district for our high school IB coordinators who are going to meet with us and help us through with that process. And then we have a little bit of staff feedback. And this, this just happens to say my name, but it could say Ellen's name as well because every week we plan. And so what's going on in one building is going on at the same time in another building across town. But the staff person reflected and said, thank you for all of your planning to make these PDs fun and valuable for us. We are learning lots and the time goes quickly because you've made it fun and interesting. And I'm enjoying integrating the learner profile and PYP into my classroom. I'm excited for my students. So we want to thank you for your support and belief in this program. We consider you also a key part of our journey. And we have a little key and a little bag of goodies, right, for you as well. And it's fascinating to me to how much my bucket has been filled so far on this journey. And I always am the recipient or Robin of the stories that we hear. So I'm going to share just a few of my favorites. So first grader at Plymouth in the car talking to her dad says, Dad, I've decided I'm going to be a risk taker. He said, what? He said, yep, we've been talking about it at school. And and uh, he said, well, what kind of risk taker? And she said, I'm going to try that new piece of equipment on the playground. I've never gone on it, but I, I think I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to take the step, and I'm going to do that. Unfortunately for her, then she fell on that piece of equipment. So she's decided being a risk taker is not that great. <laughs> okay. um, another one of my favorite stories, kindergartner at Woodcrest, uh, his teacher was coming back from lunch and saw him outside and saw that he was standing up against the wall and she walked over and she said oh what's what happened what's going on kind of put his head down and he said mm, didn't follow that central agreement <laughs> <laughs> um third grader at plymouth had a substitute teacher he's um extremely passionate about anything to do with World War II and she said to him um, you need to put your books and things away because we're going to do math and he looked at her and said I know I know I'm just trying to find balance in my reading but it's very hard <laughs> <laughs> and then um, kindergarten at Plymouth the um, teacher had they were practicing some letters and at the end of the lesson she said to them could you circle the one that you're most proud of the one you think you did the best job and they did and then she said to them now what you were doing boys and girls is you were being reflective you were taking a look at your work and so that was fine and they understood that probably three four days later they were doing the same thing with numbers she asked them to put their papers away and one of the um, children said um, wait, can we please find the one that we did the best and we'll practice being reflective? <laughs> and then maybe my favorite, over there on the wall next to the big essential agreement that we um, drafted as the four schools, you'll see one in child writing. And I got an email at home and it said, 
Well, we're trying to watch that Michigan State-Michigan football game, but our daughter in the middle of it decided that she thought it would be great if we had an essential agreement for our family. <laughs> so um, they sat down together, the four of them, and drafted that essential agreement and signed it, and now it's hanging and posted oh my inside of their um, house, and they let me borrow it so I could bring it tonight. So as Robin said, in this envelope, Megan, we just put together for you just a little sampling of some of the things that we've done. So you'll find in there what we call our community brochure. So it explains a little bit about what the PYP is and all of the um, teachers in the four buildings will give this out to parents at parent-teacher conferences on Wednesday. And you'll find a little piece of one of our PDs. Um, one set of reflections is mine and one set is Robin's based on two books that we both read and shared and then the staff kind of looked at it and decided what they thought spoke to them and then what action they could take based on that. And then I'm sure you're all dying to know what else was in the suitcase, so I put the, the complete list of the other objects and what they stood for. And last but not least, because you are critical to this process, you have your own PYP key. Oh. So thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> While she's passing, I'll let the members ask you questions, if that's oh. okay. It's fine. Yep. Um, what are you doing to educate the parents besides handing them the brochure? Well, what we, else have we, you guys we, done to We've educate? spoken at the PTOs, okay. and the PTO has that brochure that you will so have much. in your <laughs> envelope. The teachers have um, shared different things in their newsletters, and each of the four principals, we've written a little blurb, taking not. parts of this every month, and that's gone in their um, newsletters. Can I do a follow, I'll do a follow up on that. And what, what parental reaction are you getting? Um, mine so far have been ex really positive. The people that I've talked to have been positive, the parents in the buildings that have seen some of the things and displays that the kids are doing have all reacted positively at Woodcrest um, and at Plymouth. I have a bulletin board up that has images of children from around the world with the learner profile and some attitudes and I um, watched a Japanese family from uh, sitting on the ledge waiting for their older child, and a little three-year-old was sitting on the lap of um, his mother, and they were pointing to all of the people and very excited when they found the flag of Japan up there and a face that looked like theirs. So it's been positive. Yeah, my, just my, uh, my thoughts on this, and this is the reason why I've been a big fan of uh, of the IB program and especially PYP is that I hear all the time whether it's in the news or they're talking to families that we need to do education differently and there's a lot more broader um, way of thinking as far as education and this is really empowering a lot of the kids to with the way that they learn to think more globally and more open and I just think that a lot of parents one of the things I would predict that you would hear they'd be very supportive because we do have to do education differently and I, I would think that they'd be very excited to see this coming. Maybe fearful because they don't know exactly what that's going to look like. You know, the whole school is going to be all certain way, but it actually increases the diversity of learning. It sure does. And in fact, in our buildings, we've been practicing just questioning techniques for our students. And that's one thing that parents have come to me after school to say is, I can't believe the thinking that my children are doing just because of the questions that your teachers are posing. Now it takes practice to learn how to ask those kinds of questions because we've kind of gotten away from that. But we're, we're moving back towards that, and that's exciting to parents. And it's really essential, and it's where, where kids need to be to be competitive. I'm, just, I'm excited. I, I've kind of followed this process with all of you um, and attended some of the meetings, but so I thank you for your excitement, but there's been a lot of other teachers and, and people that have been involved in this process the last several years, so it's very exciting to see it all coming to fruition and what's still gonna happen for years down the road, and kind of as John said, for mostly for our kids, because they need to think differently and broader, and uh, it's a different world than we all remember, so thank you. 
We've got a couple. Don't get to escape that fast. <laughs> um, in tip, in most uh, change processes, be it technology change, whatever, there are pioneers, early adapters, fast followers, and laggards. How would you describe your distribution curve amongst your teaching staff? I think because of the way that the uh, coordinators have rolled it out, tang taking it at a very slow process, time to work on each piece and really get it solid before moving ahead, it's made people that have been uh, maybe more hesitant toward change traditionally feel really good about it. And you know, I, I hear Lynn you talking about the energy and really as a in my building and I'm sure in all of them, there's such a good energy there about that collaboration and working together that it's just kind of a natural process. People that need to move a little bit faster can, um, but then it gives great examples for, for people that are working at a different um, point and really setting clear expectations of, you know, for this month we're working on the essential agreement. Kind of things we're already doing, but just tweaking it a little bit different. Now we're working on the learner profile as a building, um, looking at those different components. Things that we've already talked about and want to instill in children, but again, we're working as a group to talk through it. So I think the pace of it has made it very nice and workable for everyone. I, I agree. I think just building a foundation and layering it, and that's what we've been doing. I think it empowers the teachers. It's been nice that we've been able to, for instance, Plymouth has worked with Woodcrest every month. So we're collaborating with different teachers. They're um, working in grade levels, and everybody's just kind of supporting each other. We as principals are going through the process too, so we're all learning together. and. Um, being able to just stick to this topic throughout the year is really powerful because we're not jumping all over the place. It's building a strong foundation, which is important because if we want it to stick, we have to make sure that we do it sequentially. So we thank you for that. And I have to tell you, the coordinators, they truly are master teachers and they've taught for a long time. And so um, the staff believes in them and trusts them and know, knows that they'll take them through it together. And I see um, you did 30 to a, 30 teachers to a site visit in Fenton, I think you mentioned. 15. 15. And as you're going to do another 15 to another site, and you have 130 total teachers. We have some that have gone in the past. Ah, Last okay. spring, we, we sent some. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, Scott? I have a couple. First of all, thank you for doing such a wonderful job with this program. Um, I, I have a couple questions um, that kind of related. As this becomes more and more known throughout the community, are you finding uh, maybe parents from Siebert or some of the schools not involved asking to have their children school of choice into that because of the PYP program? No, I'm not aware of that. And I think it's because we've really uh, spoken very uh, strongly as an entire MPS team that, that the idea is for it to be in all of the elementary and that to rolling it out, looking at four person and bringing on would be the most effective way to do that. I think the other piece is all of the elementaries are doing the learner profile, which is really that key foundation piece, talking about balanced and critical thinking and inquiry, um, those pieces. So the conversations are happening there. In addition, those schools do have other initiatives that they're working on right yeah. now. So that's where their focus has been. And I think as a parent community, um, they understand and appreciate that because those pieces started before we moved forward with this. So they were already energized about those parts going on in their schools. Okay, well that answered my, my well, second question as well. No, we understand. I think uh, that it's coming, and I think at PTOs, they, we've also discussed that as well, that we're not being left out. It's just happening in phases, and I think they understand that. Good. That was a, you know, that was a concern. It's, it's such an exciting and attractive um, component in those schools that you know, I was just wondering if there was a draw um, from the other schools to want to be part of that maybe they're not aware that it's going to be rolled out district-wide. Well, I think as a team, um, the eight of us, the six of us actually meet on a monthly basis, but it's open up to all elementary principals and they often attend just so that they hear what we're doing and are, are in the loop of the process. So when it comes to their turn, they can see it easily and start working on it as well. Now you mentioned that the um, feedback from parents has been mostly positive but what are have there been some parents who were have there been some doubters and and if there are what do you say to them to or has that not happened I, I really haven't felt that no. initially, okay. 
there was some confusion when, when people compared it to the high school program, right. which is different courses, sure. students selecting it, where this is for all students and all teachers. That probably had perhaps more questions last year about that when we were contemplating um, what kind of direction that, that we would be thinking about as a group um, and, and sort of suggesting. But once people realize that their children would, everybody would be involved in that, it does increase the ability to differentiate. And so for students that may struggle in some areas, it, it really opens up a, a different way for them to express their learning that while we work on that constantly, it, it maybe broadens that capability and, and helps them as much as it helps kids that really need to be pushed and moving beyond um, and enriched as well. So. I haven't had negative feedback, but I think part of it is the pace that we're going and really working at educating the community and taking it piece by piece mm -hmm. instead of we're PYP and now we're there. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not that kind of a program, it's, it's a several year process. So it's learning as, as Bridget said, you know, learning together. And I think with teachers, that takes the stress out of it as well. It's not that some are way ahead of the game. We're mm -hmm. all starting kind of from ground zero and, and building that understanding and troubleshooting it together really increases the collaboration of the lottery, I think, as the staff and the energy of the building. It does. And I also want you to know, too, it integrates beautifully with our curriculum. We're not adding and throwing right. something else mm -hmm. on top. We're finding a way to marry it within what we're already doing. Well, I wanted to say, too, that I liked what you said about how it, it works sort of with the whole person. You talked about how it makes the world a better place, a more caring world, and I think that's a really important aspect too because I think we all want to think that our children and grandchildren will live in a more caring world so I applaud you for what you're doing I think that's great thank you Any others? thank you for not only coming tonight but your efforts and I'll turn it back to you Mike and we're going to go over the Di Distinguished Service Award. Cindy, you have a presentation? Yep. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> She's surprising me. <laughs> Very good. So our 2013 Distinguished Service Awards. Um, this is the criteria for it. We're going to go through real quick. A little history in, in there for you. And you know it's modeled after the Gerstacker Teacher Proficiency Award. Um, it's a criteria process. Uh, it's grant funded and the committee makeup we're going to go through and the role of the committee. That's the committee this year that served. Um, the chair was Penny Miller Nelson and we have a board member as well. Yvonne was set on that committee and several teachers and um, uh, MCEA reps <coughs> as well. Past award winners. And the winners this year we had, we have Lynn Heidesek. Heidesek, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, she said Lynn's been with the district since 1994 at Woodcrest Elementary, and we heard many glowing remarks about Lynn when she was out there, and she was very surprised today that we uh, uh, give, gave her her award as well. Craig Northrup. Um, 1993, he came into the district as custodian. He presently is a building manager at Northeast. Um, and Craig was our first award winner we gave this year and um, we, we think Craig had a little heads up or had had some notice he he, he kind of felt like he knew he, what, where we were going that day with it so it wasn't quite as surprising for him but it was a nice day and he had his family there in that bottom picture you can tell as oh, well nice. and I think that's how he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Lori Kennemeyer we have um, from Midland Public or from Midland High School um, she started here at the Administration Center She's in her 13th year in that position. Some glowing remarks there about Lori as well. And our final award winner from the Administration Center was Gary Siebert. And uh, Gary's got quite a story where he started as a custodian and then began to pick up those technology skills and now is a station technician here. Has been in the district since 98. We had uh, Gary's family here as well. So we had grandchild as well as his father. So we had the whole the whole oh, wow. gamut here. So it was a pretty neat experience here at the administration center that day as well. So it's a, it's a great award that we're giving out 
four winners for this year. Wow. Congratulations to all of them. Well, congratulations to all those folks, and thank you for everything they do for us behind the scenes, but uh, supporting, educating our kids. So thank you. With that, uh, we move into uh, a necessary item here, and I'll hand it over to Linda. Yes, thank you. This is a necessary item. Uh, we are permitted by the state to collect half of our local property taxes in the summer. And we do that by levying on city properties only during the summer and then on city and township in the fall. And we have a slightly different rate on the whole harmless that we apply to the city property. So that, that's how it breaks down into a 50-50. And although we have done this for many, many, many years, uh, law requires that we make the request to the city no later than January 1. We typically have liked to do it in about the November time frame, so we don't have to worry about weather problems or, or anything else. And so that's what you have this evening is the levy or, or the resolution that will notify the city that we would like them to levy on our behalf next spring. The next step of this will be in May with a resolution that will indicate the specific amount that we would ask them to levy. And some of that depends on what the property tax values are at that time. So it's a multi-step process. And then it finally ends in the fall uh, when we have the final taxable values for the year and we're able to determine what the ultimate amounts will be and then the, the December amount gets tweaked a little bit. So this is step one of a three-step process. Thank you. I'll ask the secretary to read the resolution then we'll see if there's a motion and second for it and then do a roll call vote. Yeah, I think we can uh, probably do the motion at the end. Okay. Uh, whereas Act 333, Public Acts of Michigan, uh, 1982 provides that a school district may determine by resolution to impose a summer property tax levy of one and a half or all its annual school property taxes, including debt service. And whereas this Board of Education adopted such a resolution on November 24th, 1986, providing for a summer property tax levy of one half of the school property taxes, including debt service, upon property located within the city of Midland and providing for such levy in 1987 and continuing from year to year thereafter. And whereas for each year such resolution applies, the school district must request before January 1st that the city of Midland agree to collect the summer uh, tax levy in the following year of either the total or one half of school property taxes, including debt service on um, property within the city of Midland. And whereas said Act 333, provides a, for certain procedural steps to be taken by this Board of Education in connection with imposition of a summer property tax levy and also provides for the manner in which such summer property tax levy shall be collect, uh, collected. Now therefore, be it resolved that, number one, this Board of Education pursuant to 1982 PA 333 hereby imposes a summer property tax levy of one half of school property taxes, including debt service, upon property located within the school district within the city of Midland for the year 2014 and continuing from year to year as authorized by this statute. And number two, the secretary of this board of education is authorized and directed to forward a copy of this resolution to the governing body of the city of Midland together with this board of education's request that they agree to collect the summer tax levy for the ensuing year uh, for the amount as specified in this resolution. A copy of this resolution and request to, to collect the summer tax levy shall be sent so they are received by the City of Midland before January 1st, 2014. It looks like we have a vote. I'll accept a motion to approve the resolution. I move that we approve the summer tax collection resolution. Support. Moved by Treasurer Branset and support by Member Gordon and will require a roll call vote. Gladly. Uh, President Wasserman. Yes. Vice President Baker. Yes. Secretary Kaminsky, myself, yes. Treasurer Brandstand. Yes. Member Gordon. Yes. Member McFarland. Yes. Member Singer is absent. 6-0, it passes. Yes. Thank you, and thank you, taxpayers. And I'll hand this now over to, it says Mr. Vernon, be here. I'm going to take that. You're taking it up? Yep. Um, we're going to ask you tonight for your approval for the Midland Community Center. On behalf of the Midland Public Schools to add middle school competitive cheerleading as the Michigan High School Athletic Association sport at Northeastern Jefferson Middle Schools for the winter season. 
Um, if approved, Northeast is playing a field with both a seventh grade team and eighth grade team. Jefferson's going to have a combined team of seventh and eighth grade girls uh, for the school year. Uh, it's expected this addition will offer an additional 45 middle school athletes uh, during the winter season. Uh, Gary also left with me just a couple other things I'd mentioned to you. Uh, the competitive dates run through November 8th, from November 18th through February 6th. There's five of them that they have scheduled all locally, so there's not transportation costs involved with this at, at all. And um, also that uh, they have uh, qualified uh, coaches out there for both teams and also some, uh, I guess, a pledge of assistance <coughs> some of our high school people that are involved there. And also that it's not, um, uh, we did the research into it, it's not the, uh, the lifts that you would see at the high school level. It's uh, uh, meant for middle school, so they don't have the high lifts and the, the kinds of things that we'd have to worry about as far as uh, liability and injuries on that. So. Well, that was pretty extensive. Um, I'll take a motion first, and we can ask questions. Move approval of item 4.5 for middle school competitive chair. Moved by Secretary Kaminsky. Support. Support by Vice President Baker. Any questions? I'm, I'm sort of curious. Where did the interest in the program? I mean, it, you would you would think that maybe we'd have some sort of a program. Um, is this just formalize it at the middle school level? But maybe they've had opportunities elsewhere. I, th I think competitive cheer is relatively new at all levels. Okay. So I think as we discussed it with, when I talked about it with Gary, it, it really came from uh, the community center, which was getting interest from the girls themselves that they wanted to be involved in it. So mm -hmm. I think it's a more recent thing. And, and of course, you got to have competition to have the competitive cheer. So there are local teams. So I think it all just came together at that time. Okay. Well, and I think cheerleading was one of the sports that was cut in middle school, wasn't it? I mean, maybe not competitive cheer, but they used to have Sideline. middle school, you know, cheerleading. Yeah. They had a spirit squad, yeah. I remember those. Mm -hmm. right. So this is kind of nice. It gives another option, right. Mm -hmm. right. replacing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I'll comment before I vote. Uh, this whole uh, collaboration with the resources in town, you know, that we, one of the first, play, one of the, I won't say first, but one of the more substantial ones we did early on was with the community center. And it just shows that we're providing opportunities for kids that we wouldn't be able to really provide without these collaborations. And uh, I know my, my wife helped uh, with junior high tennis a bunch, and it's just interesting what we can still provide because of these alliances we have that other schools in our area and or the Saginaw Valley Conference no longer can. And uh, so I, these, I'm really pleased with this alliance to offer more opportunities to kids. It's great. Okay, with that, uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Now we'll move on to curriculum and instruction. And Lynn, you have committee meeting minutes. Yes, I do. We had the pleasure to meet on Monday, October 28th at the new Longview Early Childhood Center. And while we were there, Michelle Barr, the Director of the Special Education for the Midland County ESA, presented an overview of the new Longview Early Childhood Center. Located in the former Longview Elementary Building, the center is home to the following agencies and programs. Early on, Great Start Collaborative, Parent Coalition and Central Resources Center, Imagination Library, Kinder Care of Midland, Mid-Michigan Community Action Agency, Quality Preschool Partnership, Head Start, Great Start Readiness Program, Early Childhood Special Education Classrooms, and Preschool Inclusion, and Early Intervention Services. After the overview, committee members took a tour of the building and the various programs. Next, we came back and uh, we met and talked about full day kindergarten, and kindergarten teachers Amy Burks and Christina Whale provided updates on the second year of district-wide full-day kindergarten at MPS. They discussed benefits, challenges, and changes with the addition of full-day kindergarten. And lastly, we discussed three major change proposals that were presented by Bob Cooper. Two of the proposals, Spanish 1 and Computer Technology 1 and 2, deal with a change in point levels due to increased rigor in the coursework. The third proposal, Contemporary Business and Contemporary Business and Technology deals with a name change, grade level change, and changing to a blended learning form of instruction. 
These three major change proposals are being presented tonight to board meeting for the 28 day examination period. And these minutes should be outside. And as always, it was a, it was a great meeting and it was just very exciting to see uh, how Longview has, um, has, has new life as the, the early childhood center and it was bustling and lots going on and uh, they, they've done a lot of work in planning and in designing a, a new beautiful building. So it was exciting to see Longview back in action. Any uh, questions or comments for Lynn? I'm just sort of curious how, uh, um, I guess, how how busy is the um, is the center as far as the capacity? Are they off to a good start? Half full? They are. Or? They're very full. Mm -hmm. okay. They're they're almost bursting. Okay. They are very very full. It's hard to imagine an entire elementary school full of preschool kids. age kids. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting the design. Um, they've divided that big gym into three different sections. Everything's very kid, family, friendly. It's colorful. It, um, it's, it, the upgrades they've made is, it, is wonderful. And also, uh, Michelle said they are one of the most secure school buildings, I believe she said in the state now, um, as we were buzzed in and out of a couple different sections. It's divided so that the school part is in one part of the building, and that is completely um, secure from the public part of the building where, where some of the uh, community programs are located. So That's anyway, very, very fun. Very I thought fun I visit. read an article that they were serving in their combined services within the building uh, north of four to 600 families a week. Um, so that's, I think, really substantial. And it, and I don't know if that's busy or not in terms of the size of the building. I, I haven't seen the facility, but um, I, to me it strikes me as a lot yeah. of people pretty, moving pretty through. Cool. And the other point uh, she made, it's nice to have everything under one roof. It just makes it easier for these families. And any family, we all know when you're taking a child to school and if you have to make several different stops and there's needs, that it's all under one roof and, and the support is there for that. So it was uh, very, very positive. Excellent. With that, uh, move over to Bob. How about follow up then with those major change proposals that we just heard about. Uh, we have three of them, which is a little different. We usually have more of them coming your way, but there were only three. Uh, again, they're just for your consideration tonight. They don't require any action tonight. You'll see listed uh, the three, uh, what's going on in each of those, and their costs. And of course, always upon approval, well, do we implement those changes now? We'll depend on the budget as we go forward. I, I point out a couple of things to you. Um, like I said in my the notes uh, from the committee meeting, uh, World Language is doing a point level change, which we have from time to time, and um, so is the Computer Tech 1 and 2. A uh, little different in how they do those. That's always the interesting part is the career tech education field has found a way within the single class to provide a couple different options for kids, whether it be point two or three, based on what they're asked to do. And the Spanish one is just a straightforward change from a point two to a point three. The CTE, uh, can uh, contemporary Business and Contemporary Business and Technology has a name change with it, which is just going to take it to Advanced Business because they felt that uh, Contemporary Business wasn't telling enough. I don't know if Advanced adds a lot, but it's there, so it's another name. They also wanted to open it up so you could um, go to 11th and 12th grade, and most interestingly there, um, those teachers want to maybe be our first attempt at blended learning. Uh, they're both awesome. teachers that are taking uh, classes currently on their own. Um, it's also a class that's going to be a nice one to try because uh, it's not always offered due to enrollment at one of the two schools or either school. So it's one of those that will give us a nice place to start on if we can get everything to work out. So they'll be there for consideration uh, for the 28 days. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer. Okay. Well, Bob knows I have a question because <laughs> I've talked to him before. But if you could just highlight for everybody else the question that had come up in my household, and that is why we're now going to have a point three Spanish um, option for kids, and there is not a corresponding point three option for French and German. Right. It's, it's an interesting process, major change. It has people from across the district, uh, from curriculum, all the curriculum people, of course, but also the principals, et cetera, they come. And the proposals come from all those different areas also it can come from individual teachers, uh, curricular areas, it can come from the principals, and those come to the committee. 
Now, the committee then kind of goes through and, and uh, asks all the questions. We have people of all level of experience there, so we're asking the questions. It's interesting, the first question that came up when it came forward was, do you think French and German are going to follow the same suit? Typically, uh, they've indicated so far that, that that's, they just weren't ready for that yet. And part of it is when you change a point level, uh, you have to demonstrate a change in the, I'll call it the rigor, but it's, it's really the intensity of the course and how deep you're going in and it goes everything from how much homework to how much time you're, you're spending. And I think at this point in time, especially because Spanish has added the survey of Spanish classes, that they're seeing a slightly different uh, uh, ability to go further in those classes. And so one of the things they do then is come forward with a proposal that presents the, the increased rigor. And so, for example, I know they're going to do some more things grammatically without reading the whole thing here, but also in the listening area, what they're going to be able to do listening as opposed to what they used to do. And that's how they then match up with the rubric that we have that says there should be a point three class. And I think right now we just haven't had that come forward from either the, the French or German teachers at this point in time. Doesn't mean we won't see it as early as, as next year or you might not see it. It's a, point levels are an interesting thing where people sometimes, you know, we wish, wish we had none, wish we had more, uh, wish a couple were combined. It's just interesting as uh, at the time I've been here how that varies from year to year, course to course, what people think's attractive, what uh, rigor they think the course develops. Uh, the hard part about that is it's hard to compare across subject areas to say, you know, I'm working this hard in a point three class here. Is that the exact same class I'd see over here? Uh, much easier to do point levels when you're talking about um, within a subject area. And I think that's why Spanish has just been first, just because they have the survey class, which is running at a point two. They know how far they're getting through the survey courses. So um, they can see a, a real area of being able to increase the rigor in the Spanish one class, but it's always open. We do the changes this early. You can imagine why it's a major change proposal because you, first you got to get them into the secondary course offering guide so that kids can actually select them. It doesn't do any good to do major change proposals at the end of the year when nobody knows what's going on. So we, you have to come pretty early in the year to get started on it, but uh, we try to have everything done so that by December 1st we can get them into the course offering guide counselors can get it out to students, students can sign up, and then we also have the rest of the year in the summertime to develop anything we need to for those particular courses. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> Thanks, Bob. I was uh, particularly intrigued by the online blended learning aspect of that one course, <coughs> and uh, maybe we'll learn as much as uh, our students. Yeah, it'll be a learning experience for us, but I think it's a, it's a good course to be trying, and, and, and two really uh, uh, teachers that are pretty excited about it uh, one from each high school, so it's uh, across the board Perfect. kind of thing, and I think we're, we'll, we'll learn a lot as to what will work. Thank you. And we'll move to finance, and Angela, you have an FFO meeting report. Yes, I do. We met last Tuesday night, um, and this time, instead of meeting here, we actually met at East Lawn Elementary. And um, I'll just read what we did here. In preparation for long-term planning, our group began the meeting with an in-depth tour of the building. East Lawn was chosen for the first tour because it is one of the oldest buildings still in operation. Carpenter is 20 years older, but it did go under, um, underwent significant restoration a little more than a decade ago. East Lawn was built in 1947 and is nearly 70 years of age. So it is better representative of a building that has received ongoing care and maintenance, but is still in need of costly repairs and improvements. Next month, we will tour one of our newest buildings in the district, Dow High School but it is actually only 20 years newer than East Lawn, and it is approaching the half century mark and is also showing its age. Following the tour, Mr. Charo and Mrs. Klein discussed the need to engage an architect to conduct a thorough analysis of all our facilities and help prepare a long-term capital budget. Administration will prepare a request for proposal in the near future. Mrs. Laux presented the September financial reports she stated that the cash low point for the year of $3.9 million occurred on September 20th. Um, to put this in perspective, bi-weekly payroll costs are $2.4 million. So it was a good reminder that the fund balance is not the same as cash on hand. Despite a current fund balance of millions of dollars, MPS may need to prepare for borrowing in the 2014-15 school year if the current spending patterns continue. 
Uh, the maintenance department has identified two projects of an urgent nature that require spending from the sinking fund. The first is replacement of the roof on the, on the restrooms at the community stadium. Despite multiple repairs, it continues to leak and is causing damage within the buildings. The, S, the building. Estimated cost is nearly $9,000. The second is replacement of tubes in one of the boilers at Woodcrest. Um, seven tubes are already replaced earlier this fall, and there's concern that if the remaining 41 tubes are not replaced, the boiler could fail. Estimated cost, nearly $6,000. Mrs. Klein will work with the department to bring a recommendation to the Board of Ed to approve both of these projects. Mrs. Klein reported that in order to reduce costs and avoid costly boiler repair, the Science Center is being relocated into space at Central. And our next meeting, like we had said before, will be at Dow High, and that is going to be Tuesday, December 3rd. In addition to touring the building, we're going to also have a presentation from representatives of the High School Athletic Booster Clubs who hope to follow the lead of tuning up and looking sharp by creating a joint project fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation that can be used for improvements to the high school athletic um, facilities. So that should be very exciting to hear from them. Thank you. Quite a bit in there. Yes. <laughs> As it was at the meeting. Any questions or comments to Angela? But it was very interesting. It's always fun to go through the buildings. We went to the depths of the building. Mm -hmm. I have now been in a Colvin <laughs> 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 that is under the parking lot. Former Colvin. <laughs> Former Colvin, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, the fascinating thing that I always wrestle with to get my head around is the age of our buildings. And we talked about this a lot when we went with the sinking fund millage. You know, I've been in town 30 plus years. When I arrived here, Dow High was the new building. And you do the math and you realize Jerry isn't so new anymore <laughs> when, when you figure out how old that building is. And uh, to put it into perspective, it's only 20 some years older than East Lawn tells you how old our buildings are getting. So, Linda. Yes, we have some gifts. They total $2,081.55. Uh, we have the Midland Area Community Foundation providing support for Dow High School's Camp Outlook. I believe this is something that they do each year. Uh, the HH Dow High Music Parents have supported a choir class trip to the Detroit Opera House. And the uh, Midland Area Community Foundation also, I believe this is through uh, the Gang and Violence, uh, what used to be known as the Gang and Violence Partnership, provided support for a week of nonviolence activities for both Midland High and East Lawn Elementary. I know they support activities in other buildings as well, and I think there may be some other gifts in the pipeline for that. Uh, then we have a gift of a donation, and we have received this before, and I will describe this as a match made in heaven. The K Press has paper rolls that uh, they are not able to use to the absolute bitter end, and so they have a, a small amount of paper left on them. And our teachers, as you might guess, love to use paper and have all kinds of good ideas for it. So McKay Press has donated these paper rolls to us for projects at the various schools. I believe they just get snapped up because they're wonderful things to, uh, to be able to use and it helps McKay Press get rid of them. So good Excellent. partner for us. And we would like to thank all of the donors for what they've done. Any questions or comments for Linda? Just to comment on those end rolls, I was using those years ago for scout projects, et cetera. I had a parent that filled me in on that, and it is great. It is great paper, and I am so excited that we're using that because otherwise it was just tossed. So it's a win-win for everybody. Yes, thank you for all the donors. Move to uh, human resources, and I don't know who's pinch hitting for the HR part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cooper? Not pretty quick one okay. today. <laughs> uh, we have one retirement, Chris Rakowski, office professional, uh, Midland High School, effective February 28th, 2014. Thank you, Bob. Um, you'll see the list of correspondence in the agenda to and from the district. You'll see the list of our <coughs> upcoming meetings, and you'll note the December meetings in particular, the 2nd and the 4th at 6 p.m. Start doing our strategic planning around the future of the district. Um, that moves us into the study discussion, and the first thing on that part of the agenda is officer nominating committee for the board for next year. I'll just refresh the entire board and the public on the process. Um, 
our policies call that the the board uh, prior to the new board taking place uh, nominates a slate of uh, uh, nominates three people to be a subcommittee to come and nominate to the future board officers for that future board uh, so this board will be making a nomination slate and then after the first of the year when the new board is in place since there is no election it will be the same people that are sitting here um, will vote on that slate or propose other candidates for that slate so I will be passing out as we traditionally have done here uh, a ballot pick uh, three please and Linda if you'll be so kind to be our tabulator again and uh, pass these out Linda will know when you're done. What is the nominating committee again, Jerry? I'm sorry. The nominating well, this committee nominates, creates a slate of nominated candidates for board officers for next year. So, if you're on the committee, can you put yourself on? You the could slate? end up putting yourself on exactly. Okay, I just want to make sure yes. there was no. No, no. You can do one. No, the other. Yeah, you, you can go. Both. John asked a question earlier tonight privately, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. question is yes, and go either way. I mean. It's just three people as a subcommittee to bandy about who they think the best four officers would be, and then the whole board votes on it the next time around. And and the whole board, the new board, also has the opportunity to nominate other people if they so choose as part of that process. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, with that, we have hearing from board members, and since I started to the, from my left the last time, I will start from my right this time. Ooh. Alrighty. I just would like to um, thank the veterans once again. We, ha we have so many that have served from our own community and, um, and their families as well, because it truly is a sacrifice of time and, um, and effort. and what they do for our freedom so that we can sit here tonight we can go to school we can live in a country that is is free and uh, I just would like to give my personal thanks for all that you do and and um, to make all of us app and hopefully appreciate what we have and then next I had the privilege to uh, volunteer as an usher at the bully side project last week and uh, eighth and ninth graders and many others in the, the surrounding uh, districts attended at the Center for the Arts. And I, I'm not sure who all was involved in bringing that to, to the Midland County, but it was an incredible program. I, to sit in an auditorium the size of the large auditorium at the Midland Center for the Arts and be able to hear a pin drop with, with uh, 12 to 14 year olds is pretty amazing. So it was a powerful program, um, an important program. It's a, sad, it's a sad topic, but something that we all all need to learn and uh, it was well received by the students I believe and the staff and just a couple uh, other little notes good luck to Midland High football and Dow High volleyball teams they will be uh, moving on this week in competition and Dow High's play noises off is occurring Thursday to Saturday and I see that there's conferences at the <coughs> middle school and elementary buildings and and it's so important for for our teachers and our parents to be able to connect and, and talk about our st their students. So hopefully that they will be well attended. And I noticed that Adams had their Count Me In program today and that's been ongoing through the uh, district this fall. And that is just such a wonderful uh, program on, on dis different disabilities that uh, students have and all the parent volunteers and the teachers that help with that. I know I've had the privilege to participate in that and it is a phenomenal program so on that note I think that's I'll pass it to you Yvonne well I guess I just want to say once again that I never cease to be amazed by our teachers and what they do um, congratulations to Mr. Fox on, and his students Aaron and Thor and Richard I, I think that's the most amazing thing and I always wonder am I just easily impressed but obviously not because they were the only high school team there I just think that's so amazing so 
Congratulations to them on that. And then also our uh, teachers that presented on the PYP this evening. That was really great to hear that. We you know, we really haven't heard much yet. So that was really nice to hear that. And just, I was just real impressed with what they're doing and just the way they're doing it. I just think it's great. That's all I have. Okay. Um, congratulations to the um, Distinguished Service Award winners, the, uh, you know, the exemplary support staff and going above and beyond. Um, it's great to see the, um, uh, the recognition and putting a spring in their step and spark and recognition for what they do day in and day out. Um, it was great to see that the PYP pre program is off to a good start. Um, really is nice um, with the foundation support to see that off and running. It's going to take some time getting there, but I can just sense the excitement in those buildings and where that's going to go, and I think it's going to be very promising. Um, and then just uh, also another uh, um, shout out on Veterans Day to the veterans in the, um, in the district, the teachers, staff, administrators, and recent graduates of MPS. Um, a lot of them have served or are serving now, and they continue to um, help the MPS family get prepared students and serving the country through preparing great citizens and students going forward, and it's really admirable. And every graduation that I've been at, uh, Mrs. Castle, Mrs. Greif, they usually do recognize about a dozen or so um, uh, graduating seniors that are going into the military that pick that as a career. Um, and just as a veteran uh, serving during um, Operation Desert Storm, it, it really, out of all the things I've accomplished, probably service to this country is probably one of the greatest things I've ever done, and it remains to be that way. Um, and when you run into other veterans, no matter what time period that they served, um, it, it really is like a small fraternity. Um, the service men and women, you, you know, you, you choose some of the same dirt, you go through some of the similar type of deployments and things that go through, and it really is a, a great experience. And so it's just really nice to recognize that. All right, Chris, I just want to say, like you all, I love the presentations today. I love how we continue to bring in um, and showcase some of the great things that we're doing in the district. Um, the second thing, um, probably most of you know this, um, today Dow didn't have um, high school, which my son very much appreciated. Um, <laughs> however, I wanted to use this to highlight the new, um, and help me with the exact name of it, but our new notification system that we're putting into the district, and I know we're about one week too late for it <laughs> to have worked this morning, although I did, before 5 a.m. get this morning, get an email telling me that Dow High was closed and just, that's a fabulous thing. And then also today I got an email to um, text back my um, cell phone number so that I can get um, text messages when these things happen. And today just really showcase why that's so important for parents to uh, make sure they take the time to do that so that the district can get a hold of them. Because today would have never been a day I would have turned on the TV to see if school was canceled. So um, there was that. And then one more sports team I'd like to recognize. The um, Dow High girls swim team took their eighth um, SBL championship this weekend, and many of them are off to the state meet in a couple weeks. So, congratulations to all of them. And that is it. All right. Uh, I thought today was a was a really exciting meeting. It was it was great to see um, really our teachers rock. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Uh, that was so impressive to see. Uh, Mr. Fox and his team and what they've accomplished in 36 hours. That that app was cool. I loved it being an attorney, seeing the bills, seeing who sponsored them, seeing where the House or the Senate and where they were at. That was awesome. Um, thank you to uh, our donors as usual. Our, our community really steps up to to help fill the, the needs, the financial needs that, that we have as a district. Um, thank you to our veterans, uh, your sacrifice uh, and your families uh, is not lost on me and obviously not lost on this board. Um, with that, everything else I think I wanted to say was very eloquently covered. So I'll give it back to you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, again, I made my comments earlier on the veterans, and John, thank you, and, and thank you, everybody out there. Um, I'd encourage everybody who may be listening that one way you can, you can just show is to go like to the Memorial Day uh, celebration, or not celebration, it's, uh, services, if you want to say that, at the courthouse every year. Crowd is usually sparse. People start lining up for the parade, but it's awful nice to just show that you understand and uh, and give thanks. Um, again, what everybody else said here, uh, but the PYP, I'm hugely excited. The energy level that our folks are bringing forward, the teachers uh, adapting and, and moving and and growing, and uh, that differentiates us. 
So I'd like to thank them for doing that and, and for helping differentiate us. You know, you, we look at the things that we struggle with, but boy, when you wrote a roadmap of what's new in middle public schools over the last six years, the list just keeps growing, with PYP being the latest. And the mobile app thing, I didn't realize they were the only high school mm -hmm. team competing either. I saw some of the other prizes were, for lack of better words, grown-ups, <laughs> but I did not realize it wasn't like a high school division, so real hats off. That was That's incredible. And uh, uh, what, a, what a great opportunity and a way to represent us. Um, two other comments. Uh, the one was read in the F, um, FFO. I'd like to salute the boosters for coming together to do their thing with the, the Midland uh, Community Foundation. That's worked great for our music parents, and uh, it's glad to see that collaboration continue with our athletic parents. So thank you very much. And then lastly, um, I'm a member of Rotary, as several members here are, and uh, the keynote speaker at this last week's meeting was the president of the ARC of Michigan. Um, and he got up and talked about the journey through time uh, for assisting uh, disabled citizens throughout the community in many, many aspects. Uh, gave Midland very glowing reports and more specifically Midland Public Schools very glowing reports uh, for how we do things and how the community rallies to do things for our citizens uh, um, that have those proclivities. So I was very proud to be sitting there hearing someone from outside who talked about the long journey of, of uh, assisting disabled folks uh, salute Midland and Midland Public Schools as some of the leaders in that area. So it was, well, it was a moment of pride. That said, uh, back to the first item, officer nominating committee is going to be myself, Angela, and Lynn. Uh, please, if you have ideas, get with any or each of us uh, beforehand. I'll be getting with you about when to meet. We don't have to have a slate prepared until the January meeting, but we'll get that done before the holidays roll around so we don't get all bound up with the holiday stuff. So. Thank you very much. And with that, anything else? Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> We've covered so much of it that um, maybe we should just move on. Um, there's, there's a few things I'll mention that you didn't mention tonight. Um, our school newsletter comes out this coming weekend. So make sure you pick up the Sunday newspaper. It's going to be in there. Cindy's put a tremendous amount of work into it as well as the building supplied a lot of uh, information so Cindy could put that together and um, we, we got a copy delivered to us sometime last week and it looks really good so I think you're really going to like that when you get that in the Sunday paper piece of it and thanks for Midland Daily News for helping us out with it as well. Um, as you know we've been looking at the budget a little more closely uh, between what you adopted last spring and our enrollment trend not meeting what you had built the budget on um, where we're trying to move forward with some reductions um, why we speak instead of waiting you know to another budget year and so we think we can make some changes and we have made some um, you know I, let me give you a quick reminder of some of those changes we've made um, instead of filling positions you know we've been uh, either reshaping them or not filling them at all so when Randy Shady, Shady left the district um, to become a superintendent we moved those duties to pen present staff Penny Miller Nelson and Jeff Lauer um, when Mr. Cooper took over for, for Kathy Ellison, um, you know, we rearranged those duties at that time as well. And so those were two positions that you saved money on. And then most recently, we've uh, had a payroll person, the Bravo coordinator, and I'm, I'm missing a physician, sub-caller. Sub uh, and, and we've combined those into a even skinny down position, one position, but even, even skinny down. And so, um, and then Dow High School, had a um, athletic secretary leave, and so that position was not filled, and those duties were distributed amongst the office staff. So we've been able to reduce some funds already, but we still have quite a ways to go, and um, certainly more discussions to come with you as well as other staff in the district as we move forward on that budget. Um, we did use the school messenger system this mm -hmm. morning, and so uh, it was the first trial, maybe a good trial before the snow hits. We did have some snow out there today, too, so maybe was that we're getting ready for it all. The school messenger system worked fairly well, and it was important that it did work this morning because we had a lot of issues going. One, we had no technology in the district as well with that power down, and so we certainly weren't able to use that in the district, and um, which meant, you know, a website and some other things we weren't able to put that on. I had some little bit of tr trouble getting to Channel 5, if you noticed this morning, it was on all the TV stations but Channel 5, 
because me being new maybe, I don't know how to close just one building on their website. And so <laughs> I, I tried, <laughs> but I certainly wasn't going to close the whole district by mistake. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I aired on the right, right way. When my neighbor and I, since it, it was new, yeah. we, we weren't even sure. We're like, is this a real email or, yeah. you know? <laughs> Somebody spamming us. <laughs> now we'll know from now on. I think Linda and I are dragging the Linda, I, I look back at my timestamp on my phone. She called me at 3.13 this morning. And, you know, that's right about that time where you can't go back to sleep, too. So <laughs> certainly I didn't go back to sleep. So I'm, if I'm dragging here, you, you'll know why we're, we're, where we are. So, um, And I, one more reminder, Enhancement Millage re Renewal. Um, and we're going to begin to, you know, get more information out to people why that's needed. Um, but we're going to need that renew as we, renewal as we go forward. Uh, the other th uh, only other thing you didn't cover tonight that I wanted to mention was Mr. Cooper and I visited the Alden B. Dow House, mm -hmm. and what a great partnership we have there as well. And I'm and I, I'm not sure. Uh, and Bob's certainly been here a lot longer than I. But the stories I've told of our partnership it was even more than what I expected, and, I, and maybe Bob as well. Um, as you know, they host our IB Theory of Knowledge kids over there, both schools on different days. But when you really sit down and you start talking to Craig, and I had to ask him what his background was because he certainly is an educator, even though that's not his formal training. Um, really neat lessons that they put into, um, meaning the Dow, not, not our teachers, but with the work that they're doing with our students. Really deep, deep thinking stuff. And then they also hold the IB Art Projects there for us. And now they are working on a seventh grade writing assignment as well. And we talked about possibly partnering up with our IB PYP programs. And they're excited to support us in any way, any capacity they can. So uh, that was a great trip over there. And we walked them up away very impressed. Plus, we got the full tour of the building. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have today. Okay, thank you. Anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, we stand adjourned.